maybe we start with the first round of three, then see, see how we are going. Alan, start with you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Alan Rowe from the uh, University of Warwick and UN Wider. Question for Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, you, you hang a lot of the uh, sort of difficulties of sub-Saharan Africa currently on the impact of the 2009 crisis. And your data showed that a drop in one year and then a, a very quick recovery. But it seems to me a much simpler sort of explanation is to do with the, the commodity price movements, which again your own data show, because there was a blip in commodity prices in 2009, quickly reversed, but a much bigger fall after 2011, both in the oil price and in uh, other commodities of relevance to Africa, such as uh, copper in countries like Zambia. Um, and, that, and that fall has persisted. This wasn't a one-year blip that was reversed. It, it has persisted almost until now. Um, and of course, uh, it's Andrew Mackay's point that the, the impacts of this are differential across different parts of sub-Saharan Africa. You know, if, you, if you're Nigeria or if you're Angola and you're exporting oil as your major, uh, almost your only export, um, a fall of from $120 a barrel to $40 a barrel does disastrous things to you really quickly. And the figures you put up on the, on the growth performance were averages. So you know, you've got countries like Nigeria and Angola that have been hit really badly. Uh, in the last uh, three or four years. But equally, you've got a lot of sub-Saharan countries that import oil who've had a, a terms of trade benefit from this. And you can say there's similar things, I think, about um, uh, the, the metals prices. You know, uh, copper price has fallen very badly, which has uh, done a lot of damage to, um, to Zambia, from which it's, it's finding it very difficult to, uh, to, to recover. But these are effects which are differentiated, and I, I would argue that the Malaysian Southern Africa now, if there is one, is really very little to do with the 2009 uh, global crisis. It's much more to do with what has happened to the global commodity prices linked to perhaps the decline in growth in China and other factors instead. I see others. Uh, yes. Um, Comment to something that uh, Graciela del Castillo from City University of New York. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you talk about decoupling, and it was very interesting because in Latin America, the decoupling was always associated to the stronger fiscal situation, and that would decouple us from what was going on in the world. So I, I thought it was very interesting that you looked only in terms of the banking sector. Um, and and the, the fact that most of the confrontation took place uh, through trade flows, that was the same in Latin America. Now, uh, the other thing that I found it uh, surprising is that you talk about the shocks and how that affected uh, the African uh, South Saharan economies, but you didn't mention the domestic policies. And, you know, I don't know much about Africa, but I've worked in, in Nigeria and in uh, Liberia. And those countries, it's, it's the bad economic policies that make them uh, so uh, vulnerable to the shocks. So I was surprised. Andre mentioned in Latin America some of the important fiscal um, political um, domestic policies that uh, made the, the, the continent more resilient to shocks. But you didn't mention domestic policies at all. Yep. Back there? Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, yes, thank you very much. My name is Ibi Ajayi. I'm from the University of Ibada. I listened very carefully to the very excellent papers uh, presented today, and uh, I want to ask one or two questions about two of them. Let me start first with the paper by Lawrence. I, I, I am very interested in the paper because uh, in 2009, the African Economic Research Consortium put up um, some seminar workshop together in Nairobi, and I happened to be the coordinator of that conference on the global financial crisis. And I think since then, this is the first time I'm seeing a paper that tries to address this issue, which uh, Lawrence did. And of course, in his answers, he was saying, did they recover? Yes, directly. 
and know indirectly and try to uh, give reasons why that is so. Now, I, I was thinking in my mind, uh, the whole process all over, isn't really the problem one of the global economy, uh, what you call rumbles? The global economy had not actually settled down ever since. When you look at the transmission mechanisms which we examined that time, some of which are also being examined here by Lawrence, they really have not changed. And therefore, uh, the whole world is in perpetual readjustment, and Africa is no exception. In other words, Africa is adjusting to what is happening in the global economy. Uh, you could, of course, say that maybe the institutions and the uh, framework for adjustment for Africa are not solid enough to, at least at the um, internal level, uh, to say maybe the macroeconomic environment is not right, or the policies being put in place are not sufficient enough to be able to address all these rumbles when they happen. So I was wondering whether Lawrence would want to give answer to that, um, that, that kind of uh, assertion. Uh, of course, uh, the pessimism of the intellect is there, no doubt. Um, it is not possible for any country to be, you know, all by itself now, it's a global economy. Inevitably then, Africa will have to be perpetually adjusting if the global economy itself is in, is in, is in rumbles. Secondly, I want to address the issue that the macroeconomic perspectives, which my friend Andy was also trying to address. And uh, he, he was saying or talking about how to adjust in the future. And he says uh, there is need for good quality education to be able to you know, understand that in the future. And that struck me. And I said, well, if you have very good education, as some people have in many countries, you graduate from one of the <laughs> most important universities, and you have no job yourself. How will you, how would then, well, how then will I understand the economic world surrounding me with all the education that I have? The education on paper with the quality, how do, how do I adjust to that? I was wondering whether Andy would be kind enough to try to explain this kind of situation to what is happening to a lot of African countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let, uh, I think let's, uh, let's take a few more so that uh, uh, I, because I've seen uh, some hands, I saw you, sir, and then uh, I'll come to you, Madina. Should I start? Uh, okay, you can start, then I'll come to, to you. So, okay, thank you, yeah. Chair. Uh, mine is also a bit easy and straightforward. Uh, but what has been the role of the political economy in controlling these economic shocks? Uh, I thought <coughs> Lawrence would either have handled some of these or Andy himself, because the politics of handling economic shocks is also in itself something which I thought could come in in terms of uh, addressing these economic shocks. Thank you. Okay. I'm Winston Dukuran, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I wanted to make a small comment on small economies and the ability to respond to shocks. First part of the comment is that small economies, particularly in the Caribbean and to some extent Central American region, faces shock as a permanent <laughs> phenomenon. It is not a transition. And therefore, the size of the recent shock is all that matters. The political history, the economic history, has been consistently how to adjust to shocks over the years. And therefore, it made it much easier to try and handle some of the issues of shocks. That was done by developing re buffers of resilience in the economies, um, both from the point of view of, I think my sister talked about domestic policy, endogenous policy for capital mobilization uh, as an ongoing process. And secondly, the establishment of, of, of funds, wealth funds, in order to face the rainy day. And the third area had to do with the support from the international financial institutions, which invariably looked at shock as a temporary phenomenon, not as a permanent phenomenon. And therefore, their whole approach has been based on the fact of providing temporary cash dynamics and cash flow support 
uh, and that always dissipates over time. So once you get into those programs, which are improperly designed for small economies, you never get out of those programs. Um, so those are the three areas of, of, of resilience. Um, the other aspect has to do with the flow of funds. Um, and one of the distinguishing features I found um, was that in these economies, well, you ended up with strong fiscal deficits on the public sector. You had, at the same time, fiscal surpluses in the banking sector, which were insulated from the global financial world, but they are part of the global system. So the strong regulatory system made them insulated from it, and therefore one of the problems you had was how, therefore, could you not bring about endogenous growth if you have fiscal deficits and fiscal space um, always falling, uh, but you have private surpluses? Now that's an area that very few governments want to tackle directly. Um, but it, in fact, is one of the areas for resilience that has to be addressed in terms to provide a, a capacity to respond. And the first paper, um, all papers that were presented, um, I, I see the value of it, um, but we're trying to look at beyond tomorrow, how do you prevent these shocks, which now is a permanent feature of life, not a temporary feature of life. And how do you face up to that reality in the future? I wouldn't mind getting the comments of the learned professors on this. Okay, I think we have about uh, six uh, interventions and uh, I would uh, leave it to the panelists to pick uh, the ones that are directed to them or the ones that they would uh, feel wanted to give more elaboration. Now, let me go through the same cycle. We'll start with you, uh, Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank, thank you very much for, for the comments, uh, all our colleagues here. Um, uh, I have to say that I agree with all the comments that were directed towards me and all the perspectives that you've offered. Um, uh, uh, how can I do that? Well, I do that by explaining that um, when I saw Daniel uh, had given me only one more minute, I thought I had better stop, and therefore... I was unable to go into all these things in depth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but that is entirely my fault. I should have highlighted them uh, at, at the beginning. Um, it, it, uh, of course, I mean, I, I, I feel, uh, of course, it, it's very much the case that you know, the, the experience of shocks is very much a varied experience across sub sub-Saharan Africa, just as it is, you know, uh, between continents, and I'm very grateful to Alan for you know, making that clear. And uh, as Alan says, you know, we've seen good, good micro um, attitude uh, uh, perspective on that um, fr from Andy. Um, so I plead simply, I didn't have time to go into all that. Uh, um, but um, the the, um, uh, uh, the and I think I agree entirely with what Alan said about you know continuing. Um, uh, problems um, in Africa um, and I think that's what I was talking about the continuing problems but uh, 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 Alan did start out by saying that you know, these are the continuing effects of, of the global financial crisis and yes I, mean, I, I agree with that that's the sense in which I say yes the global financial crisis had these indirect these effects that are indirect because they you know, we we're experiencing them in the you know, more recent years, the years after 2011. Um, and uh, they are, I see them as sort of longer term indirect effects. And what is their nature? I mean, I see them, I see their nature as being some of the things that I touched upon, such as the you know, uh, great shock to trust um, um, that, that occurred within as a result of the crisis, the belief in future volatility rather than the, you know, as a result of the shock and so on. Um, all these things have effects. And indeed, our, our colleague from City University of New York, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, um, yeah. Tiana, um, was quite rightly, I think, pointing to um, 
you know, the 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 uh, the role of uh, domestic policies. Um, uh, what I would say about that is that yes, I take that for granted that there's there are problems of governance and uh, and um, particularly uh, including economic governance um, uh, that are endemic or are long-standing. And, and I was saying that, well, yeah, and I think the crisis has made those worse by creating this social fracturing and the breakdown of a social contract to the extent that it existed and therefore made it more difficult for, made it impossible to see a way in which governments could take a lead now in restructuring their economies to deal with, um, uh, or societies, for these shocks. That was the nature of my pessimism. Um, Asiana also was explaining that, um, you know, I, I didn't talk about the fiscal sector uh, linkage, and uh, I agree that, that that's crucial. I mean, I was, I was picking up on the, the literature that was around in 2009, 2010, which was focusing upon the question of are there direct banking sector links. The fiscal sector issues are, are the, the fiscal issues are in, incredibly important because the 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 upturn that we saw um, immediately after the sharp downturn um, uh, was due entirely to fiscal stimulus. Well, I say entirely due to fiscal stimulus. That's not true. As Beppo has explained, there was a very significant monetary stimulus as well. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's also a very significant coordinated international fiscal stimulus, um, coordinated through the, the invested, investing of new powers in, in the G20, um, which enabled the G20 countries to coordinate a big uh, fiscal stimulus uh, coming from European countries, North America, and, and, and China to a very large extent. Um, and those, those are to be recognized. And the issue then is, could that fiscal stimulus be maintained? Well, it should have been, but it was cut short. And that, I think, had a major impact in, in uh, slowing world growth uh, and, uh, and uh, slowing the world markets on which um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa's uh, uh, depend. What happened was the fiscal stimulus was cut short by a consensus developing that um, uh, governments you know, have to uh, cut back on their borrowing. But it's now recognized, even by the IMF, which was quite, had quite a leading role in that, um, it's recognized that that stimulus was cut short too quickly. Um, so, yeah, it's, and I'm glad that you've brought that up because it is... Um, <coughs> it, it is... Uh, a very important dimension. The uh, as E.P. was um, saying, you know that um, uh, you know as E.P. was saying, the global economy, you know, hasn't really um, uh, settled down, and that's 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 one aspect of it. Um, but I see that in very general terms too, as I put up on the board that. Um, you know, there are current macroeconomic imbalances uh, across the world. Um, and a better way to put it is that there's just um, uh, a continual um, uh, uncertainty about the kinds of policies that any individual nation can, should follow, um, it, in the macro level, um, and their coordination. And um, that, that... They have to cut you short. Oh, I'm sorry, an another... I've, I've, I've overrun again, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I see that as being, you know, a key thing in, in, in restricting the abilities of economists to, to grow and world trade to grow. And so, yeah. Thank you, Rasebo. Uh, let me... Uh, they were not talking directly with me, but let me take this question about the shops and and small economies, uh, small economies, because that, that uh, has, has aspects that uh, I would like to comment on. Uh, you know, the, the important distinction, of course, here is, is that 
is, you know, obviously, you know, the suggestions about resilience, rainy day funds for economies to build are, are very welcome. I mean, this, they, they, if managed well, they will certainly help and give, give an opportunity. And if available, they will help. Uh, they will be they will be of great help when when the recession hits uh, hits uh, that that is that is definitely important and also the fact that international organizations can if they can provide uh, this kind of assistance assistance it's the the question i think which is a harder question is the question about the temporary versus long term if you if you you know you know this kind of of, of buffers and and assistance Assistance and, and uh, you know rainy day funds, they will they will obviously be most useful for against relatively temporary shocks. If you have a if you, if there's a permanent change or semi permanent change in the circumstances, then I think the answer is that uh, the economy has to adapt. You have to start the process of re, uh, of adjusting to that, those circumstances which are going to prevail uh, uh, foreseeably long time. And, and, but obviously, this you know this is easy to say. Of course, in practice, it's it's more difficult to uh, to uh, consider this. I mean, we we probably did not expect, for example, this the after aftermath of this of the global crisis to continue so long and 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 seems to be continuing <laughs> even even into the future. And and so so these things are you know things which may perhaps look at short term may turn out to be longer term. But but then then obviously you have to. Have to have to make adjustments. So this is, policy making is not going to be easy on this. But I think still the distinction between temporary shocks and longer term problems is is <coughs> crucial because it, it it is important for the nature of policies you take. And the the buffers are important. Uh, 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 various buffers are important, but they are more for the temporary shocks. Thank you, Sebo. Uh, Andres, two minutes. Well. I think that one of the questions or, or the remarks were about the political economy or, or social dimensions of, of adjusting to shocks. And I think this is a very important uh, topic. And for example, uh, I have uh, been doing some research on, 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 the, on the impact of, of uh, austerity in Spain and, and Portugal uh, and Greece after the, in the aftermath of the 2008 and 2009, and looking at uh, the effects of, of those policies, uh, adjusting to a shock, basically, uh, and you see that that most of the of the of the cost is bared by labor and, and low income groups, and in part the middle class. Uh, uh, you see, for example, uh, Spain has been operating with uh, unemployment rates between 20 and 25 percent over. Uh, six, seven years or, or even more. And, and youth unemployment, the same people between 18 years old and 28 years old, the rate of unemployment has climbed to near 50%. In Greece, which is one of the most, most uh, recent cases of uh, uh, protracted depression in the sense that the country is uh, experiencing negative growth for uh, its eighth year in a row, which is probably unheard of in the history of depressions or, or recessions, uh, you see that, the, again, the average rate of unemployment in Greece is 25%. Youth unemployment has climbed up to 60%. It's slowly declining now, but a little bit. Uh, as part of the adjustment process, pensions have been cut and the middle class have, has been hit. So it's very regressive. And also use some uh, a database on wealth distribution that was available for, for the three countries. And you see an increase in the, the, the share of the top 1% in total wealth, both in Greece on the order of 35% and in Spain on the order of 20%. So this is a very asymmetric uh, adjustment to, to external, uh, to, to shocks, I wouldn't say external, necessarily, part internal, part external. So I think this is a very important uh, topic and, and, and to what extent you are putting a lot of stress and fatigue on democracies when you have this protracted adjustment uh, on the middle, falling on the middle class and the poor and, the, and, and labor, is an open question that we see now happening in Europe. I mean, the the the, the resumption. I mean, the, the 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 rise of nationalism, populism, and etc. Probably is not uncorrelated with these shocks. Two two words on the on the on the sovereign wealth uh, funds. Yes, these these were created thinking that. Uh, 
or are created, it's not easy to manage them. Uh, uh, two, two issues that are important. First, uh, for low-income countries, you have to cut consumption uh, in the government uh, to, to save resources to create the funds. That's one thing. And then you have to maintain the funds. And so there is, uh, again, an opportunity cost of spending in, uh, in social needs or in, in infrastructure and keeping uh, money in this, uh, these funds. The other issue that uh, in Chile is part of the discussion where there is overinsurance. You are saving too much and you don't use it. And, it's very, and there are not clear rules. You have clear rules for accumulating resources, but you don't have clear rules for using the resources in the wake of an external shock. It depends completely on the judgment of the ministry, the Ministry of Finance, basically in Chile. And uh, so this, these are two issues uh, that I would like to to comment. And the other is well, again, we are living in a world of more frequent financial crises and frequent cycles. Therefore, what is permanent, what is transitory, is not that uh, clear right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, qu um, qu uh, quickly, first in response to EB about education. I mean, also, also on that list, I had employment and financial uh, uh, increased access to finance because I think it's got to be. I think it's got to be a package of these things. Of course, we're educating more people across Africa. Not particularly good quality, but more people are being educated. But there's no jobs, so what are they going to do? And the potential political risks of that, of course, are quite substantial. So there's no doubt that the education has to go along with uh, with other things to create to create economic opportunities. Um, uh, Briefly on the political economy, that issue also arises at a micro level as well. So, for example, the response of Vietnam in response to the balancing the interests of producers and consumers, that's a political economy interest. Do you favor the interests of the urban con of the consumers? Do you favor the interests of the producers? Do you try and balance it? That is an important political economy issue. Another important political economy issue is attitudes towards migration, because there, big political economy issues come in as well. So that's also an important issue. And just briefly, as Andres was commenting on Spain and Greece, I was thinking those youth employment figures would be even bigger if there hadn't been a lot of outmigration as well from those countries. A number of people have left. And of course, these are the more educated people leaving. But, 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 but you know, that, that, that's part of the response. But, but even with that, even with that out migration, you have youth employment figures, unemployment figures of, of the size that he's talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andy and uh, the, the panelists. Uh, we have come to an end of this session. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and all the participants uh, for the active participation and their, and, and their attention. Uh, I will ask uh, all of us to make a round of applause to our panelists.